Welcome back. We are getting ready for session four. It is our final panel discussion of can we ever control HIV in the absence of vaccines? What we'll do is have an introductory lecture. We'll have uh, then transition into a full panel discussion. Our introductory lecture, lecture is uh, vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. And that's gonna be provided to us by Shelley Karuna. And Dr. Karuna leads global clinical trial collaborations to inform HIV and COVID-19 vaccine development, and also to advance monoclonal antibody regimens for HIV and COVID-19 prevention, treatment, and cure. She is the director of the Broadly Neutralizing Monoclonal Antibody Program of the NIH NIAID funded HIV vaccines trials network. She guides programs vision and also the strategic plan. It's a great honor to have Dr. Karuna with us to be able to speak about vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. Thank you. It is my pleasure to talk to you today about vaccines and monoclonal antibodies for HIV prevention. I think we are all well aware of the scope of the ongoing pandemic, and I simply want to call your attention here to the last couple of points, reflecting that nearly twice as many individuals acquire HIV each year as those who die of AIDS-related causes, a phenomenon that sustains and expands the HIV pandemic year by year. Many of us have devoted our professional lives to combating these numbers. And those efforts have led to great progress in HIV prevention in recent years, as you've heard earlier in this meeting. Yet considerable risks, including demographic changes and other competing global priorities, threaten this progress. Recognizing these threats, UNAIDS observed just last year that as much as ever, the world needs an efficacious HIV vaccine. UNA's observation was based, among other things, on data and models like this. Here, the steeper decline in the dotted lines in this graph reflects the addition of an HIV vaccine to supplement other HIV prevention tools and approaches. In these models, it is only with the addition of an HIV vaccine to the prevention package that we see a reduction in new HIV infections below half a million per year. We even approach zero. Now, this model is in a low and middle income country context. But a similar phenomenon of substantially improved impact on HIV incidence and prevalence in the presence of an HIV preventative vaccine is observed in locations like Seattle, Washington, where I am based, where this model incorporates high access, uptake, and adherence to other prevention tools like PrEP. So, that begs the question of what is stopping us from adding an HIV vaccine to this prevention package. This virus makes it difficult. As a side note, by comparison, most of the challenges listed here contrast starkly with the lesser yet still considerable challenges posed by SARS-CoV-2. And if that's of interest, in the panel discussion, we can explore this contrast and consider the myriad ways in which HIV and COVID-19 prevention efforts have informed each other in the panel discussion. So HIV is a rapidly integrating retrovirus. It leaves only a very brief window on the order of hours to days for the recruitment of vaccine-mediated responses. It is also a hypervariable and evasive virus, and it infects humans. There's no ideal non-human model from which we can learn. It can be acquired across different routes and throughout the life cycle. Furthermore, for most of the last four decades since HIV was identified, it did not appear that HIV could induce protective immunity. At least any protective immunity that it could induce was outpaced by viral evolution and escape. But with respect to this challenge, we've made significant progress in the last few years, particularly with respect to identifying a correlative protection, which acts as a goalpost, if you will, for HIV vaccine development and a validated marker that will help us understand how near or how far we may be from that goalpost with a candidate HIV vaccine or other biomedical prevention strategy. That goalpost or marker of HIV protection potential is related to neutralizing antibodies, antibodies that bind to the HIV GP120 envelope protein that is used by HIV for viral entry into host cells, 
And when these antibodies bind to GP120, they neutralize HIV, draining it of all color, so to speak, um, and preventing it from establishing infection. That process is reflected in this video, in which at the bottom of your screen, you see the host cell, like a CD4 positive T cell, with its receptors displayed on its membrane. And you see antibodies in circulation. These could be antibodies passively infused or elicited by a vaccine. When HIV comes into the picture, those antibodies bind to that spike protein on the virion, again, draining it of all color to represent neutralization, and HIV exits stage rape. The use of neutralizing antibodies in this way is not new. Since the late 1800s, neutralizing antibodies, initially as part of serum therapy, and then as gamma and immune globulin, convalescent plasma, and now monoclonal antibodies, have been used to prevent infection or to prevent disease caused by many different pathogens. And most effective vaccines induce neutralizing antibodies to the pathogen. For years, scientists have been asking whether and or how HIV could be added to this table, to this list. And in 2016, the NIAID HIV Vaccine and Prevention Trials Networks, in collaboration with the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH, set out to explore that question of whether HIV could be neutralized by these neutralizing antibodies and that process. And they asked this question through two parallel global HIV antibody efficacy trials that were conducted at nearly 50 clinical research sites worldwide. The trials evaluated, evaluated a monoclonal antibody called VRC01, which binds to the HIV GP120 spike protein at the locations depicted here in red, the CD4 binding site on the HIV envelope trimer. Over 4,600 participants, including men who have sex with men and trans individuals in the Americas and Europe, and women in Sub-Saharan Africa, enrolled and received either lower or higher dose brc one or placebo. And they received this in an IV infusion that was given at enrollment at week zero, as depicted here, and then every other month thereafter for a total of 10 infusions administered over about two years. HIV diagnostic testing was conducted at least monthly, and a full HIV prevention package was available to all participants. The AMP trials proved the concept that yes, HIV can be effectively neutralized. That is, it may yet be able to join that list of pathogens for which infection or disease can be prevented by neutralizing antibodies. But the degree of neutralization necessary to prevent HIV acquisition was only observed in individuals who were exposed to viruses sensitive to the AMP brc one MAB. So we learned about the breadth and neutralization potency necessary to prevent HIV infection. And importantly, this neutralization was detected with an assay that can now serve as a validated tool to predict efficacy of other preventative HIV broadly neutralizing antibodies and of the vaccines designed to elicit them. Finally, the neutralization titer readout from this assay appears to have provided us with that elusive correlative protection. And thanks to the AMP trials, we now better understand how to correlate the neutralization that we observe in non-human primate models to humans. Altogether, these advances are really quite transformational for the global effort of efficient HIV vaccine and monoclonal antibody development. However, Overall efficacy in the AMP studies was not observed, with positive efficacy point estimates, but confidence intervals clearly crossing zero, as depicted here. That leads us to ask, what is available for the majority, depicted in the lower two lines of this graph, who were not sufficiently protected from infection by VRC01? Well, VRC01 is now one of many available MABs against HIV. Several other MABs binding to a similar area of the GP120 at the CD4 binding site are in clinical trials, and several MABs that bind to other neutralization-sensitive epitopes, like the V2 or V3 regions of the envelope protein, are also in clinical trials. To illustrate the implications of these numerous options for HIV-neutralizing antibodies, let's look at a familiar analogy. On the left of the screen is a depiction of the HIV replication cycle in a target cell with various stages in that cycle labeled in black. On the right 
is a depiction of the HIV GP120 with various neutralization sensitive epitope regions like the CD4 binding site that we were looking at earlier and others labeled here in different colors. Different antiretrovirals target different points in the HIV replication cycle, just as different monoclonal antibodies depicted here target different neutralization sensitive epitopes or locations on the HIV envelope protein. We know the impact that combination ARVs can have in support of optimal HIV treatment. And we hypothesize that combination MABs can have a similar impact in support of optimal HIV prevention. MABs, like antiretrovirals, target the structure of HIV, the HIV envelope protein, in order to impact the function of HIV, i.e. to neutralize the virus, preventing GP120-mediated viral entry and the consequent establishment of HIV infection. As with antiretrovirals, utilizing MAB combinations may limit the acquisition of MAB-resistant viruses and may limit in vivo viral escape if HIV is transmitted in the presence of MABs. These trials here listed from the HBTN, Caprisa, and the Rockefeller group are all evaluating combination monoclonal antibodies for HIV prevention. In addition to continued evaluation of MAB combinations, there are several other ways in which the HIV monoclonal antibody field is advancing, such as through identification and development of additional antibodies, including those with greater neutral neutralization potency and breadth engineering of the FC or foot portion of MABs to extend half-life and to enhance additional antibody functions like antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity or phagocytosis, ADCC or ADCP, to supplement the neutralization function. We're also working on improving MAB delivery. For example, appreciating that while IV infusion was highly successful in the AMP studies, subcutaneous delivery can be much less challenging in many settings. And last but by no means least, working with community, industry, and other stakeholders to prepare for global implementation of this HIV prevention approach. Even with much more grounds to cover with MABs for HIV prevention, they've already contributed greatly to our efforts to address many of the challenges of HIV vaccine development as listed here. And if you'd like, we can explore these further in the panel discussion. The HIV vaccine effort was clearly ready for this kind of help. While no HIV vaccine approaches entered efficacy assessment for the first two decades of the HIV pandemic, in the last two decades, over half a dozen HIV vaccine efficacy trials have launched. In each trial, various viral components have been included in vaccine inserts that were formulated into DNA plasmids, viral vectors, or as protein administered with various adjuvants, and each regimen generally intended to stimulate one or both adaptive immune arms, eliciting B and or T cell responses. Only one of these trials has yet demonstrated efficacy. In the RV144 TIE trial, 60% vaccine efficacy was observed at one year, declining, however, to about 30% at the pre-specified primary efficacy time point a couple of years later. For today's update, I'll speak a bit more about the two most recent HIV vaccine efficacy trials listed here, collaborations between the HVTN and Janssen. The Imbicoto trial, as well as the Mosaico trial that I'll mention in just a moment, were informed by two non-human primate experiments in which a viral vector and protein vaccine regimen provided a high level of protection, over 90% protection from infection per exposure in monkeys, and a phase one trial demonstrated evidence of encouraging broad immune responses elicited by the vaccine regimen in humans. The Imbicoto efficacy trial sought to extend these findings to demonstrate HIV vaccine efficacy, prevention of HIV infection, in women in sub-Saharan Africa. The vaccine regimen consisted of an adenovirus shell that contained a mosaic vaccine insert, a blend of gag, pol, and omb amino acid sequences from multiple clade B and clade C viruses. And that was designed to elicit the broad cross-clade immune responses that were observed in the phase one trials. That mosaic viral vectored vaccine was given at four time points over the course of a year. And then at the last two time points, a clade C protein vaccine was co-administered with the ad mosaic viral vectored vaccine. The vaccine regimen in Imbicoto was safe with no differences in moderate or severe adverse events across treatment arms, vaccine or placebo. However, 
the regimen did not prevent HIV infection with a point estimate of 25% vaccine efficacy and, again, a confidence interval that crossed zero at the pre-specified primary analysis time point one year after participants completed vaccination. The ongoing Mosaico trial, which is being conducted among MSM and trans individuals, utilizes a very similar regimen to that evaluated in Mbokoto. The primary difference is that in Mbokoto, at the last two boost vaccinations, an additional mosaic protein-based vaccine was co-administered with the last viral vectored ad mosaic and clade C protein vaccine. And that, again, is intended to add further breadth for a truly global vaccine. This study is ongoing in eight countries throughout the Americas and Europe. So where are HIV vaccine efficacy trials going from here? To come somewhat full circle to start, the neutralization-based biomarker that was validated in the AMP studies can help us down-select more efficiently from early to later phase trials and can help us conduct later phase trials more efficiently through interim analyses that may reveal neutralization dynamics and thus prevention potential before an efficacy or non-efficacy signal may be available. The role of other HIV prevention modalities that you've heard of in this meeting must also be considered in the design of HIV vaccine efficacy trials. This is a topic to which whole meetings are devoted, and I won't explore it in greater detail here, but we can do so in the panel discussion if you'd like. The HIV vaccine field, with pioneers like Carolyn Carrico and Drew Weissman, greatly aided the COVID-19 vaccine effort by sharing over a decade of expertise that they had built in mRNA technology in the HIV vaccine field, largely. The resultant success with COVID-19 was inspiring and feeds back into the HIV vaccine field, as I'll outline a little bit more in a moment. The HIV vaccine efficacy trials that I showed just a few moments ago from the last two decades have relied primarily on an empirical approach to HIV vaccine design, but rational design of HIV vaccine immunogens is leading the way in the next generation of HIV vaccine iteration, as I'll touch on also just briefly in a moment. And last, but by no means least, authentic and early engagement with communities to lay the foundation for successful HIV vaccine implementation is critical. This is another area in which the HIV vaccine field's experience informed COVID-19 vaccine development and implementation and rollout. It is also an area from which the HIV vaccine field can, in turn, learn from the successes and challenges with COVID-19 vaccines. One thing that is not entirely clear is which approach to an HIV vaccine may be the best to advance in the next efficacy trials. DNA, viral vector, protein, mRNA, and various combinations of all of these have been tried, and they have different advantages and disadvantages. We see this in the COVID-19 vaccine field as well, where mRNA vaccines were among the first to launch and have truly been a shining star, but viral vector, protein, and combination vaccine regimens have also clearly had a place in the global armamentarium. There are advantages, we think, to continued diversification in this regard. I do want to spend a moment in this overview of HIV vaccines to highlight a few approaches that are up and coming. The first is a reverse engineering approach, the idea of taking broadly neutralizing antibodies identified in individuals who've developed them over years of living with HIV and mapping where on the HIV envelope protein those antibodies bind. Then a copy of that BNAB target, that neutralization sensitive epitope on the GP120, can be made in the lab and then given in a vaccine in order to stimulate the immune system to make those BNAMs even before the immune system has ever been exposed to HIV. There are several early phase HIV vaccine trials, including those from the HBTN and IAVI that I've listed here evaluating this concept. Two other rational vaccine design approaches include germline targeting and lineage-based approaches. The idea for each of these approaches is to essentially recapitulate through sequential immunization the process that occurs in perhaps 10 to 20 percent of individuals chronically living with HIV. In this process, these cells evolve from germline through affinity maturation and somatic hypermutation to plasma cells that secrete BNABs. Several early phase HIV vaccine trials are evaluating these approaches as well. Finally, 
A major rate-limiting step to advancing promising HIV vaccine candidates is the reliance on recombinant protein technologies for which years may be required to move from immunogen to clinic. mRNA technologies can, however, facilitate rapid iteration. We are getting a glimpse of the potential of mRNA technology in COVID-19 vaccine development, and several early phase trials are launching now to evaluate this in the HIV vaccine field. All of these approaches to HIV vaccine development rely heavily on collaboration. That includes, as depicted here, collaboration across multiple fields of scientific expertise and multiple immunologic approaches. It also includes collaboration across many stakeholders, including, importantly, community members and trial participants, public and private partners, industry and academia. This also serves as my acknowledgement slide, as I am indebted to representatives from each of these bodies and many others for this overview of HIV vaccines and MABs. As we proceed to the panel to explore the question of whether we can ever control HIV without a vaccine, I'll add thanks for one individual in particular and highlights of some wisdom he has shared over the years. I think we now know that no single tool is likely sufficient to prevent HIV and AIDS globally. That's been our experience with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 as well. However, there is a single tool, an HIV vaccine, that while perhaps not sufficient, may well be a necessary component of any HIV prevention strategy that hopes to truly end HIV and AIDS once and for all. I look forward to talking with you further in the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, for a wonderful talk, setting the stage for what I hope be a lively discussion if bioweight or even moderately effective vaccine if we would ever be able to control the epidemic. i just briefly just introduce uh, the other participants. We have Kathleen Barr, who's an infectious disease physician and a clinical trialist and physician scientist who studies the basic mechanisms of transmission impact uh, of virus transmission, pathogenesis, and persistence of HIV, SARS-CoV-2, and other pathogens. She holds some leadership positions based at the GHBTN and serves as chair, co chair of virology of the trials of HIV and COVID prevention, treatment, and cure. We have Giulio Maria Corbelli, <clears throat> who was diagnosed with HIV in 1997. He works at the Community Engagement Unit at HBTN, is a member of the European AIDS Treatment Group and a member of the Community Advisory Group for the H Inside Network. In Italy, he's a member of the Board of Directors of PLUS, the first network of LGBT people living with HIV. Shelley, we just heard. Kenneth Nivur is a behavior scientist and social professor of global health and chair of the Department of Community Health at Jomo Kenyatta University in Kenya. He also an affiliate associate professor of the Department of Global Health in University of Washington. He's a member of the Behavioral Research Group of the Microscience Network, the International Pediatric Analysis uh, clinical trials network for impact and also social behavior structure working group at the HPTN. He's a co-chair of the MTN 034 protocol that evaluates uh, the O and uh, uh, ring. Carlos Del Rio is a professor and chair of the Department of Global Health at the School of Public Health at Emory. And Carlos does so many things. This is uh, this uh, so Carlos of these parts of wonder how can he know so much and how can he do so many things and wonder when does he sleep? I really wonder. And uh, Catherine Stevenson is a physician scientist in the Center of Virology and Vaccine Research Division of uh, ID and Medical Center in Boston. She's an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She's uh, uh, an uh, outspoken advocate for prison uh, research equity for Black and uh, Latinx population clinical trials. And very importantly, she obtained a master's in public health from Columbia University, where she focused on ethics of clinical trials, isolation, and quarantine. And uh, we're going to move into the discussion on, uh, on uh, can you control the epidemic. And just to set the stage, I, uh, for full disclosure, those of you, and not many of you know me, but Carlos knows me, has known me for many, many years now, when both of us had much more hair and not, not a single white hair, uh, I 
has always been very critical of uh, 1990-90, of uh, treatment prevention. I, I never thought we could treat ourselves out of the epidemic. I always thought uh, uh, that uh, I never imposed the treatment, but the contrary, I think everyone should be treated. But I always thought that treatment is treatment, prevention is prevention. And if you focus too much on treatment, you forget prevention. And I think both need to be addressed and they can complement each other, but one cannot replace the other. So from, the, from that perspective, I want to uh, hand the floor to you guys and whoever wants to go first, please go first. And uh, for once, I think, uh, with all due respect, Shelley, I think we're a long ways uh, to having a vaccine. So we need to use something, as you said, twice as many people are getting infected every year as people are dying. Thank God we can reduce nothing, not the best. The uh, scientists and researchers having uh, drugs. So that's a decreasing number of infected people are increasing. So we need to do more than we're doing. And we not, will not have a vaccine in the near future. So what can we do? The ball is not uh, filled, not on my side. No. Who goes first? I'm okay, I'll, I'll take a chance here. Uh, so I'm going to strike a note of optimism for vaccines for HIV, because I agree, we have a ways to go. It's going to take time in the best case scenario. But I think there are two reasons why I'm optimistic about the future for HIV vaccines. Now, the first thing is that there's a bunch of new strategies that are based on literally decades of research in basic B cell immunology and viral immunology that give us new ways, multiple different ways, to try to generate broadly neutralizing antibodies through vaccination. And these exciting concepts are now in experimental medicine phase one studies that are going to be rolling out, that are currently ongoing or are going to be tested in the next couple of years. And I personally have optimism that they are a reasonable shot at making a broadly neutralizing antibody, which is sort of the correlative protection, as, as Shelley mentioned, that we've seen in many other diseases and viruses. So we may have a chance of um, getting that through these novel approaches. And the second reason I have optimism is that we have, in the past couple of years, through the AMP study, through these large vaccine trials, really demonstrated the sort of clinical trials infrastructure to be able to do, and with SARS-CoV-2 as well, huge studies of promising vaccines in the areas of the world where they're most needed. And I think with these new approaches and the clinical trials infrastructure, we have a shot in the next five to 10 years to get closer to some version of a, of a at least modestly protective vaccine. You know, Katie, I, I'll take it from here and I'll be a little less uh, optimistic and maybe more realistic. I love the science. I think the science is fantastic. And in fact, we need to continue understanding the science. I think, uh, you know, vaccine and cure research are coming together, right? And whether we're gonna have a vaccine or a cure first is a big question. And, and vaccine researchers are also cure researchers in the opposite. And I think that's one thing. Those are the two sort of big, big questions in HIV research right now. It's really, is, is really the development of a cure and of a vaccine. Uh, I'm a little less optimistic because HIV has proven to be incredibly a tough nut to crack. And I also worry that even when we come up with, an, with what could be a potentially effective vaccine, and as you and others have said, a moderately effective vaccine, PrEP is so effective now that you can no longer do placebo control studies. So you need to show something that is going to be more effective than giving the standard of care for prevention, and that's PrEP. And in the background of PrEP, the good news is PrEP works. The bad news is PrEP works. In the background of PrEP is going to be really hard to show the efficacy of a vaccine. And I think that, that the challenge there is going to be really proving that a vaccine work, works despite having a background of PrEP. And PrEP is getting better every day. I mean, we thought that, you know, Tenofovir FTC was great. Well, now long-acting cabotegavir looks even better. So I think the the issue is, you know, now we're soon going to have implantables, and you're going to have an implantable for six months for prevention. How are you going to then be able to test a vaccine? 
I really think that that's going to be one of the biggest challenges ahead. Carlos, doesn't the same thing apply to cure? So if one of your cure study, you have to tell someone who's been undetectable for X many years to stop the medication? Yeah, but I think that's a little different because I think there it's a calculated risk, right? There you're really telling somebody, you know, we're going to watch you very carefully. We're going to do this intervention and we're going to be watching you very carefully and we're going to be taking care of you while you're off antiretrovirals. So I think it's really hard to tell somebody, well, we're going to take you off PrEP for a couple of weeks and see what happens, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a very different situation. But, I mean, but the cure, you're not taking off the medication a few persons for a few weeks. You have to take a lot of people for a long time to make sure that, well, now, now everyone's cured with this pill. Let's make it universal. Yeah. Uh, I, I think mean, that, that, that part will be hard. One of the, and I don't want to dominate time here, but one of the common themes for both of these comments, though, in cure and in prevention, is that the antiretrovirals really do work quite yeah. well. Yeah. However, mm -hmm. many people are really interested in a reason not to take them every day well, or not to have to follow with the clinical visits or to have the stigma associated absolutely. with medicine. So there are potentially, and, and for that reason, I think there's a niche for why people want cure and for why a vaccine, which is a at least hopefully acceptable intervention of healthy people, uh, is, is more acceptable than a, taking a pill or getting an injection on a regular basis or even an implantable, which would be okay. wonderful. I, I don't think mm -hmm. what Carlos and I argue against a cure or a vaccine. We're just saying how difficult it would be ethically to conduct right. such trials. I agree. Just, just add. So really, just how some victims of our Go ahead, If Catherine. I may, I just want to jump in and say, I mean, it's the theme here, like you mentioned, Katie, it was also the theme of the earlier session today about choice and how we've learned across multiple spheres of HIV medicine that people are different and it's really difficult to predict why they wouldn't do something that to me would seem so simple, like conject taking whatever. So. For me, when I think about these different interventions for prevention, I try to think how they would fit together and not be redundant with each other. Um, to me, I think a vaccine is sort of um, very easy for everyone to understand what niche that would fill if it could be achieved. So it's cheap, you can roll it out you know, in adolescence, it could provide potentially durable immunity over time. Um, it feels like a, a very clear niche there. I, I think for me, what I'm struggling with nowadays is about the BNAB approach and the ejectable monoclonals about what, how does it distinguish itself from long acting prep, injectable prep, which I do think is, a, is miraculous. Like I don't, this is not a bad thing. It's a great thing that we have this wonderful thing that's occurring. Um, and the best outcome ever is if we don't need an HIV vaccine at all, like that would be amazing. Um, so that, that's, those are one of the questions. So I just kind of want to put out there, like, as everyone says, I mean, this is not either or, and it's really about trying to pr create a lot of different options, um, especially because I, I think it's going to be at least 10 years before we have a vaccine, at least. So we do need to face the music with that. Yeah. Just to follow up on that thought is that, as we say, that's going to take about 10 years before we get an effective vaccine, the, the field is quite exciting. I'm actually quite excited when I look at the prevention field. We started with oral prep, TDF, FTC, which is a like first generation. But look at what it's doing. In some of the regions, I was just reading a paper by Andrew Gururich from um, North, North South Wales in Australia, where you, you see that it's actually denting the epidemic in that population. So we, with that oral prep and all the challenges that we are facing and what we are seeing even in some of the regions where we are seeing we are just sprinkling a bit of prep and we are seeing some changes, look at now what all the methods and options that um, the zone talked about in the first session. So if we, have, we get all these tools in the toolbox, in 10 years, where are we going to be? Even as we talk about injectable cab RA, which is two months, I'm sure in another four or five years, we'll probably be six months. Look at the implantables, look at all those. So when you have an implantable, which is working two years, for two years, you get your implant, you're protected for two years, then how is, how is this epidemic going to look like in about another 10 years? Yeah. No, also, do not forget that as we are talking about long-acting prevention products, 
we are also making the same progress in treatment. We are also going to get longer acting product, treatment products, and we know how potent U equals U is. So how potent is it going to be then when you have even longer acting products? So I'm, I'm seeing a very different scenario by the time the vaccine comes here, and hopefully it will still get a, a, a space. And just also coming to the end of my problem, my comments, is that we're also learning how to deliver products better. One of the things that personally I work in is around simplification of PrEP delivery. We are moving PrEP from the HIV, traditional HIV clinics to people's homes. We are doing all those things, FP clinics, hospital, pharmacies, online and virtual models, using HIV self-testing to ease PrEP delivery, simplifying actual visits, because we have done qualitative research and other kinds of research, which have informed us the barriers to current uptake and continuation of PrEP. So if we continue addressing these barriers and getting all these products, it's going to be a very different field by the time we get a vaccine. Thank you. So Dr. Negri, are you saying that perhaps um, you could in fact control and end the epidemic perhaps without a vaccine? I, I guess so. And the reason I say that is even the models we have seen, the, the modelers need to include the longer acting products. Yeah, they need to, because what, what, all those models we have seen, the, the papers, or rather that I have seen personally, uh, the papers have not included what the impact of longer acting products or long acting products coming into the field, implantables, pills, you know, injectables. And seeing how that mix is going to happen, it's going to, for both, and these models should not only look for on prevention side, they should also look for on treatment side. Because even when we, ha we had about Sibyl's presentation about viral suppression, challenges with viral suppression is also related to that we only have one size fit all. That is the oral, current oral, oral, oral treatment drugs and oral prevention product. But if we, the more we get, the more products we get, it's going probably to translate to better use. Kenneth, what happened in, in Australia also happened in the, the UK uh, when uh, you PrEP became widely available, uh, the number of new cases dropped considerably. But both are concentrated epidemics. Do you think the same would apply to Africa, where you have uh, the, the epidemics is, uh, affect the whole population? Yes, there's even a paper in, from Western Kenya, I remember the others, and they talk about providing PrEP in a, in, you know, in a combination prevention mode, mm -hmm. and there was actually a decrease in new HIV infection. And we're saying the amount of PrEP that was provided was not much, they were calling it sprinkling of PrEP. They were able to see that it actually dented the epidemic. So it's a, there is still, and just remember that this is only one PrEP option. So when you have more PrEP option, when you simplify delivery with all the methods that I've said and many more that are being discussed, it's going to be a different field. So in your opinion, PrEP to control the, uh, the epidemic and the, the rate limiting factor is the way we're using the tool we have. We have a good tool, but not using it properly. Um, probably, I wouldn't say that we would do that with just oral PrEP. Because I know, again, many of all different options, even what we are able to show in, on the rich study that uh, Simbo discussed, is that even addressing, and, addressing girls and young women, about 67% of them prefer the vaginal ring. So I would say with more options, which will be more available with probably the next two to three years, is then that, at that time where people are able to fit to choose products that fit within their lifestyle at different times of their life cycle, then we, we will probably be able to control the epidemic. And I know, Julio, you've been trying to, to chime in, so please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. related to this uh, last comment, I would say that, uh, yeah, in my knowledge, uh, there is no example of an, um, an infectious disease being eradicated without, in the absence of a vaccine. So, well, we can model the curve of the epidemics, but I think a vaccine is needed also uh, from another point of view, just because um, I'm speaking as a person living with HIV, also trying to bring the, the voices of people with HIV or affected by HIV into clinical research. And I think that people want vaccines. I want an HIV, HIV vaccine. Um, we know that PrEP uptake is difficult, is lower than expected, uh, lower than uh, we hope to, uh, we want it to be. 
and perhaps it also has to be uh, to have something with uh, uh, with taking the drugs, the taking pills, or taking also other ways uh, the, of delivering prep. So vaccine, um, I think that can can meet the the expectations of some kind some groups of peoples. We should uh, imagine an approach of a mosaic of in prevention intervention <laughs> all together can try and respond to the needs of different peoples. So if the research is going to answer the questions coming from the, uh, the communities they are super, that the science is supposed to serve, then a vaccine research must go on. Uh, we must find a solution to all the difficulties we have also related to the PrEP uh, use in the background. But I think that there are some uh, promising attempts in, in that section and of course we as community are helping trying to explain research to the communities and also inform research with a desire of communities and Julio, Julio, um, Julio I, I agree with you I would just mention that hepatitis C is a disease for which we don't have a vaccine yeah. and granted you can cure hepatitis C but there are many countries that are in the process I just came back from the country of Georgia and they're they've done an incredible job at limiting hepatitis transmission by by treating people and you know we may be able to get rid of hepatitis c without a vaccine i, I wonder what it um if it will apply at a global level too oh that, i agree challenge. Uh, because I, I could see also the valentina cambiano model you know, at croy um showing that the hiv yeah. could be eradicated in london thanks to testing and prep and uptake and so on but i wonder uh, in a global uh, world where we live, um, that, that, that is more challenging. And, and I would put you the opposite. We have hepatitis B, a disease for which we have a vaccine, mm -hmm. and yet we have millions of new infections every day, and we haven't really done what we need to do with a vaccine that should have gotten rid of hepatitis B. So just having a vaccine, well, like and, and believe me, that's a very effective vaccine. And, yeah. and, 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 and well, that's likewise the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, you know, likewise with SARS-CoV-2, we have some very effective vaccines, mm -hmm. but the considerations of, you know, there's some people who want to take a vaccine, there's some people who want to take a pill, um, there are some people who want to take an injection, there's some people who um, see an IV infusion as uh, the most, you know, the most efficacious way that they can uh, address something, right, um, prevention or treatment. So, uh, you know, I, I think, and, and some of our um, our uh, participants here have noted in the comments the comparison to contraception and to family planning. Uh, and as a as a woman, if scientists had stopped um, in the middle of the last century with just a daily pill, um, I, I I would be um, uh, devastated, <laughs> angry even at scientists for stopping there. Um, and, and I love that across treatment prevention and cure, we aren't stopping. Uh, and I think the call here is to, is to not stop, is to continue, even if it's 2070, as the models that I shared before, which as someone noted, did not include long acting injectables. Um, even if those models are optimistic, you know, I, I, I care not only about myself, my generation, my children, but my grandchildren. Whenever we can get even a modestly effective additional tool to add to that toolbox, that just flattens the curve even further. Not taking away from all of the fantastic progress that we've already made and that you know have been has been discussed um, here so far, and also not pitting treatment, cure, and prevention against each other. This is a three-legged stool, all necessary to really uh, get to the end. Thank you, Shai. That's amazing. I my ask is a it, for us as a research community is that we be very deliberate in the way that we do our research so what i mean is we're thinking about an hiv vaccine 10 to 15 years from now that we are anticipating is going to fill some sort of gap and it's going to be a gap for populations that don't want to take medications every day and don't want to take uh, small molecule style medications so Populations that I could think of that may be interested in more sort of natural style therapies or very, very safe therapies like a monoclonal, for example, might be reproductive age women or pregnant women. So let's say pregnant and breastfeeding women. 
or children and adolescents. So if we think that there's going to be in 10 years a gap of people who aren't covered by PrEP, um, we should be including those populations now in this 10-year roll-up so that by the time we have proven these things effective, we can roll it out to those target populations. Not Because it's if you think about it, the way we structure things now, it will be 20 years before we can put an HIV vaccine in a pregnant woman. And that's so we need to address that that now. Completely agree. And I think that that's one of the things that we can also learn from what we've just navigated in the last couple of years. Um, you know, obviously on a shorter time scale, but taking a very similar approach, unfortunately, in terms of excluding some of the most most vulnerable, most in need populations earlier um, in, in research and then having to kind of play catch up in, in later um, bridging trials. So how can we do that more um, efficiently and effectively now? And, and, I, and I think also um, this is one of the places where community engagement is so critical to help us identify and design trials that will meet the needs of those specific populations and those, those individuals and globally. Um, because the needs of reproductive age w women in, in Africa, the needs and the, the desires, how they would design a prevention package for themselves may be quite different um, from, from what, uh, you know, an adolescent um, in, uh, in, in the States or, or in America, um, you know, Peru uh, would, would do. So. Yeah. And well, we I think vaccinology is also one of the most difficult things to explain to communities just to um, be sure that they know what they are taking part to. Uh, for example, I wonder how we are going, if we are going to, um, in, to expand on the uh, sensitivity of the virus related to the bro uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies we are going to use. This is a, a, a very complex scientific concept to be explained to lay persons. So that will be another challenge. And this is, I have a question, I agree, and I have a question specifically, not to anyone, I'm probably I'm also asking myself. I'm wondering, is for future vaccine stud design, for studies, uh, we, since we can't use a placebo, what are those designs going to look like when we have long-acting products, when we have multi-purpose products, which, you know, which are going to be very appealing? We, how, how, how are those designs going to look like? I would be, anybody can answer, so for my own understanding. I think that, that was the point Carlos was making in the beginning. How could we show a vaccine works in an in a environment where we have, for instance, long acting cabotography being uh, uh, available and we cannot uh, deny, uh, not, 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 not offer that to participants in which we have something so effective called the designer study. We start a huge, enormous, humongous study. How to prove exactly what, what sort of design we use. So, so I, I think I think the first thing we need is we need better, and we need more phase one dash two studies in which we really show, you know, good correlates of protection and yeah. immunogenicity of the vaccine before we embark in large phase three studies. Yeah. I mean, I think we've 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 you know we've crashed the plane way too many times with phase three studies. And those are expensive. And we've done phase three studies without knowing their correlates of protection. It's been like, oh, we think yeah. this may work. Let's do it. <laughs> we've relied on animal models way right. too much. Like I feel like we should never publish another animal yeah. Correct. So we need to go, we need to go back to really <laughs> sorry, under... sorry, I take that back. I take that back. <laughs> we really we really need, need to go back to understanding correlates of protection. And we really need to go back to understanding what is this vaccine truly doing. And you know. And, and no, showing that the vaccine produces some, you know, nice dots in a in a in a in a in, in a in a blot is not sufficient. We really need to show that that is in fact neutralizing the virus. And and once we go there, then we'll think about phase three. But I will say that now I'm going to turn the optimist. Right, those of us that are old enough remember 1994 and 95 when nothing was working and our patients were dying and there was nothing to do for HIV, and we thought that th this was the end. And all of a sudden, 1996 appeared, and we had antiretroviral therapy, and people survive, and people resuscitate it. So, so I think that, again, scientific advance is not linear, 
and discoveries are not you know necessarily one after the other so i think we can be talking right now here of uh, you know a vaccine looks 10 years away and then all of a sudden there may be a, a an incredible discovery that allows us to have a vaccine in, in in three years so at the end of the day we really we need to go back to really supporting the basic science that is going to let us to effective and effective vaccine uh the one part that i am not happy about is that we continue to do i mean you know, I, I remember the history. We did, we did the, the step study. It didn't work. Not only it didn't work, some people that we vaccinated actually got hurt. You know, the vaccine increased your risk of infection. And, and then there was a bunch of letters and a bunch of people said, we shouldn't do phase three studies. But then like the alcoholic who goes back to the bottle, we went back to doing phase three studies. And because we thought we really have it this time and it didn't work and then it didn't work again. You know, Invocado didn't work. Now, what's going to happen when Mosaico doesn't work? I mean, we really need to sit down and say, what are we doing doing phase three studies when we don't have a product that actually shows the difference? So to follow up on that, though, can I? So we've just had comments about how we shouldn't be doing phase three studies and we also shouldn't be doing animal model studies and we shouldn't. Be, I, I, I just want to speaking as someone who's spent a lot of time recently trying to work to improve and validate animal models, because I do think they're essential for preclinical data. It's not that we, it's that we should try really hard to be thoughtful about our preclinical right. models and to interpret those data and to design complicated, complex animal model studies that recapitulate the key features of disease that we know of, of HIV pathogenesis of, of the world that we know are essential. And if we oversimplify the models and interpret too optimistically, that's problematic. But you know, we have to find the ways to find good correlates of protection with models that make sense and are deeply considered. Um, and then also work, with, I think right now, actually the field is trying very hard to have a whole range of, of phase one experimental medicine studies where we're testing um, a lot of novel concepts that have good biological plausibility, but we're gonna empirically test them to make sure that they seem to be moving in the right direction. Um, but like Katie said, that leaves us with many, many, many years before we get to a thing that, that we're comfortable you know, having you know, appropriate uh, optimism or excitement about. And then we have to figure out how do we ramp that up appropriately, testing the right groups, the right people uh, as effectively as possible. <laughs> and then you come to the question of if we have really effective prevention methods, how do you do ethical trials in that context? So there's, there's many hurdles, but I do believe there are a lot of people working on each one of these areas. How do we have the best um, basic science derived, you know, supported uh, approaches? How do we test them in the best models? How do we do the best phase one studies? How do we ethically do the most relevant and cost-effective and, and development-focused clinical trials on a larger stage? So I think the field is trying to do these things. I will say, so one, I'm so sorry that I ever recommended getting rid of animal studies. <laughs> two, um, as someone who's published the thing in animal studies, so, um, but the second thing is that I think this year, I, I think we're, there was a huge milestone with the AMP study. And that's really the first time that we see a very clear proven correlate of protection. Not an easy correlate to achieve, that you get a broadly neutralizing antibody that matches perfectly against a sensitive virus. But nevertheless, we didn't have it before. And I do think we kind of chased ourselves into believing that we had a correlate from like the tie, you know, RV144. I feel like the AMP correlate we can all believe. And I, I think that changes the significance of all those phase one studies. Because you could do 50 phase one studies, but if you don't have a correlate, you don't know what you're looking for. So I think something that's very different now is that we can do all that experimental medicine because we do have a correlate that we believe in now. Yeah. If I may say something about that, while we do not have a good correlates to design studies, uh, vaccine, HIV vaccine studies, we have uh, communities, groups, or uh, geographical areas where um, other prevention options uptake is low, and people are wanting to find a new prevention option. So I think that we should not disseminate mistrust toward HIV vaccine research, uh, efficacy research. 
uh, as long as the, the studies, the phase three studies are well designed, they, uh, um, they also inform very well the communities about the risks and the um, absence of benefits of participating to this kind of trials. Uh, they also inform about how to approach other prevention options, how to take other prevention options. So uh, as long as the, the, this good community engagement part is, is in the trial design, I think that the, those studies can be done, uh, can also provide some important information for, for, for research. I don't know if you, if you know, just, just, um, just say things, Shavi, because uh, being the older persons here, Carlos and I, and Julio are a bit younger than us, the irony of how things work, how the world works. I mean, uh, uh, science moves like that. I mean, I mean it sort of goes round and round and round. If uh, we were 30 years ago, it'd be the opposite, it would be scientists saying let's do the phase three trials and yeah. someone from the community say come on we want to us the community we don't want trials and then you say you see the scientists say well let's wait and see maybe we need more to do a phase three trial we need to know more about virus protection and then you have someone from the community say no come on you're being too, too cautious you know, Mara, think, I'm, I'm sure i'm not the the only voice in the community no 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 I just said to you, when, when Catherine said, well, when I, I, something, uh, so jokingly, something about animal models. And then, then Carol said, well, we need only to move to phase three when you have a, a good carnage protection. In a way, you have a very good carnage protection in the phase three trial. Because the only place to get the real good carnage protection is in a phase three trial when it's protected people. That's the best carnage protection when you have a protected person. And you only see the protected person in a phase three trial when you prove the person is protected. So that's the reason you need all these things. And science moves like that. You think you move forward, then you move backwards. And you think, well, like in 1984, we thought, I mean, when anyone who was in Yokohama at the 1994 AIDS conference said, well, it's doomed. There'll never be nothing. The 1995 AIDS conference canceled. And there's, well, what's the point? And then came 1996, Vancouver. And I said, wow. <clears throat> No, no, I, I understand your point of view, and also I understand the point of view of other community representatives mm -hmm. who are not so optimistic about HIV vaccine research. But on the other hand, I was really um, surprised to see how uh, recruitment was easy for the Mosaico trial. It, it went rather really well, and we must also acknowledge that most of the recruitment uh, efforts were done during the COVID-19 pandemic, so in a very difficult context. And when I speak to people uh, who are informed about the trial, participating to the trial, they say they want to contribute to this kind of research. And I ask why they do not take PrEP, and, and, and I find it uh, very difficult to identify some uh, clear information. We, are conduct we as a, at HBTN are conducting uh, supplement studies in some sites to try and ad address this kind of information. But some of them are simply, um, simply do not trust uh, pills, do not trust uh, drugs. So they, they want a vaccine, they, want, they, they really want that. So I think that while, um, of course, designing a trial based on uh, uh, very uh, strong, robust uh, correlates of protection would be perfect, would be wonderful. But in the absence of that, while we are waiting for some good colorless of protection, I don't think we should sit, sit and wait. We should do something in a proper way, in a very ethical way, involving communities, informing very well the communities and the participants. And Julia, I, I interrupted you, Shelley. I'm sorry. I interrupted no, I you before. Go ahead. Going, no worries. I was just going to invite Julio to speak to this question that has come um, up about how to design these trials in the context of PrEP. So Mosaico demonstrates one example, and I'll defer Ju Ju Julio to you if you want to describe that. But um, another folk, uh, another um, individual in the in the audience noted asked the question about combining different tools. That's an alternative way. Mosaico was not looking at it in that way, but an alternative way of addressing this question of how to evaluate vaccines in the context 
of efficacious alternative prevention tools is mm -hmm. to is to look at them in combination um, and to understand that they can each address either different points in the life cycle or different points in the ramp up or the tail um, of, you know, kind of, kind of can, can fill the Achilles heels or address the Achilles heels of other prevention tools. So you can look at them all together in one efficacy trial. But Julio, maybe you can speak to how Mosaico in really close collaboration with community representatives where the trial was going to be conducted ended up addressing that question. Yeah, as I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, Mosaic was designed to try and evoke people who could not find uh, uh, prevention options who would fit their needs. So uh, it was conducting in some specific countries, in some specific communities, trying to involve those who could not find PrEP as a suitable option for them. Of course, um, study participants are allowed to take PrEP during the study if they want to, but at the beginning of the study, they, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the study design was, uh, was um, um, designed to address those people who could not find PrEP as an, uh, prevention options. Uh, as a community representative, also, I am taking part, trying to uh, do my, doing my best to take part to the discussion taking place at the scientific level on how to design new prevention trials. And I think that uh, uh, beyond all the um, examples that you gave, Shelley, there are also some considerations, some um, uh, statistical <laughs> considerations that are quite promising. In my view, I'm not a statistician, of course, but I think that using also um, background uh, um, prevalence uh, or incidence for among people taking PrEP or taking other prevention options, for example, could be um, a good way to try to identify how we can cover uh, that, uh, that unmet need that is, is shown in the, in the figure, uh, in the figure of, the, of those who are not taking PrEP or for whom take is, PrEP is not uh, working efficaciously. Let me move away from vaccines a little bit. There's a, a, a question, and I think it uh, can be a, a, the co chair of our, the Pivoting Ring trial, to be the very first person to ask the question. Someone asked, how, since the, the ring is sort of uh, less than 50% effective, or like most 50% effective, uh, are we wise, the person has recommending it? Is this a live recommendation? I think that, um, yeah, yes. So I, I want to say that um, the, 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 these, uh, these statistics are based on the trials, but I want to, to draw the attention to a paper done by Elizabeth Brown we probably could Google that paper up, and you'll see that with increased, with better adherence to the ring, then the, the, the efficacy is much higher. But even if you had very conservative estimates and put it at 50%, let's say that, and that, that's very conservative, imagine what it would do at a population level when you have a product that is able to reduce the risk of HIV by 50%. It would mean that you would be able to, to, to have the incidence. And then there are also other move, other things that are happening within the, the, the pivot and ring sphere. They, we are going to have longer acting beings, like three months, which would then be even be more efficacious. So I think th these are products, and, and look, looking at what Rich was able to show us, that 67% of the young women, adolescent and young women, would prefer the ring. So you may end up having, you may have a higher effic efficacious product, but if it's not used, it's worse off than a product that is less efficacious that is uh, well used. But I wish we had more time to discuss this. No, go ahead. I, mean, I think that's extremely important. I think the ring, and we have uh, four women here, and I think that the main thing is the ring is entirely under the women's control. I think that makes an enormous difference. My understanding, too, reading those papers was that, you know, one of the key differences in how adherence went up was learning that the ring was effective like that was one of the key things so we have so much to learn still i think in these trials about how people will accept some of these interventions and maybe such a simple thing as just showing people that it works and telling them that it works may completely change their use behavior arguably so yeah i, I think we've been saying that 
as loudly as we can for a while that in this particular case, these randomized control trials likely underestimate the amount of, of use people would have. Um, and I think we are seeing this as we move out into demonstration projects and actual use of effective products. But this has been a amazing conversation. Um, really want to thank everybody but for- just, just one more question, yeah. I mean, the, the right to care, but to the women as well. Do you think if we can co uh, uh, co-formulate uh, the uh, antiretroviral with a contraceptive, that would increase adherence? I would so guess so. And, and, and I'll tell you the reason why I would guess it would increase the yeah. parents. Because the women in our setting, especially I'm, I'm, I'm in Africa, I'm seated in Kenya at the moment, is that they face the dual epidemic of unwanted pregnancy and HIV. So if you have a product that is addressing their, their double challenge, then it's more accurate to translate into higher uptake. Okay, sorry. Uh, River. No, I think right. it would be PrEP would be taking a ride on people's desire for contraceptive. Should, is that's how I think that would that would kind of work because that's of a high 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 value yeah but I, I I was just thanking everybody because our I see that we're out of time for our session so I I wanted to just take a moment to thank everyone for such a lively discussion and hopefully it's not 10 years but um certainly engaging community throughout each of the processes um would do tremendous amount um, to be able to to have that kind of uptake for when things are available. So thank you very much, much appreciated. And thanks for all the questions. I apologize we couldn't get to them all, but very much appreciate the questions from, from those of you watching as well. And, and before we go, I want to just remind the audience a bit uh, about uh, the surveys. <laughs> There's a survey which uh, uh, can we, the survey is really important. Can I, do you have that? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I don't, the program, I just, want, I just want, really want to go the survey, just think it's really important. I mean, uh, remember, deal with thoughts, so that our endorsers are here and uh, we really thank them. And here, that's what I got. That's really nice. That's really nice. Look at that. Oh. The photos of someone, but this is really, really what I'm going to say. This, as I said at the beginning, is the third uh, meeting of the series of for prevention, and we really want to go continue having this series and to have it to improve it. We really need uh, people to fill the survey and tell us what they thought was good, what they thought was bad, bad, what they thought was awful, what they think we should do to improve it. So that's the only way you can make it a better meetings. So when, whenever you can, please feel, feel or do feel uh, the survey and please be honest, say what you liked, what you did not like. And uh, once you send uh, the survey, we will receive, we will receive uh, a suitable attendance. And remember that uh, uh, this prevention meeting has been accredited by the European Accreditation Council for uh, four European CME credits. And uh, I really thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll contact you. We still don't have a date for the next one, but we we'll hope to have a next one. And I hope to see you all again. And hopefully see you all in person next time. Because I hope the COVID pandemic will be over. Thanos last words. Thank Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your time.